uh, four o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, just want to say a welcome and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I know it's a time change from last one, but I think this will be a better time. Uh, so my name is Haley, and I am a um, professor of art at ESU. I uh, just want to remind you to sign in to the sign-in sheet over there if you haven't already, if you're here for our forum. Um, make sure you sign in because that's how I count if uh, you're present, give you credit. And then if uh, you don't see your name on the art forum list, um, definitely be sure to let me know. Uh, so for audience participation, uh, if you have any questions, um, please think of them. Um, there may be an opportunity during or after the lecture for you to ask them. And uh, last but not least, uh, is there any uh, art, music, or theater students that have any art program related announcements before we get started? Hi, I'm Claire, I'm the president of Glass Hill. After this, for the uh, art walk down at the annex, down the hill from the rest of campus, there will be live glass demos from alumni Zach Arroyo and a pumpkin sale. Thank you. Anything else? I'm not an art student, <laughs> but uh, there are tomorrow night, I want to remind everyone, anyone who's interested in music, the music gala is tomorrow night. Um, and we have an amazing classical guitarist uh, from Paraguay playing. Uh, it's at Al Taylor Hall. Uh, tickets are still available. You can purchase them online. So if you're into amazing classical music, classical guitar, and even if you're not, uh, it's worth going to. And then I'll also remind everyone at the end of the month, and the dates off the top of my head are escaping my memory. I want to say it's the 25th through the 29th, I think, October. You can Google it, I imagine. But uh, Little Shop of Horrors uh, will be the musical uh, for theater this year. So just put that on your radar. All right, so let's get started. Um, I want to introduce Kale Stort, who is our uh, lecturer today. So Kale is originally from Western Kansas and had his first introduction to glass while earning a BFA from Emporia State University. He furthered his education by completing an MFA in glass at Illinois State University. Stort's early experiences focused on traditional glass blowing techniques. His fascination with molten glass soon evolved into glass casting and glass sculpting. His latest works utilize different mold making approaches and glass working techniques to create pieces that are inspired by the architectural elements of buildings and the processes dealing with construction. Kale has worked for artists in Vermont, Illinois, and Texas. Now Kale's journey has led him back to, to be an instructor of glass at and sculpture here at ESU. All right, let's uh, enter, welcome Kale Stewart. <laughs> Thank you, Bailey, and thank you everyone for coming this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, journey, my processes, and my inspirations that have um, brought up through my life and, uh, and how my work has come about. Um, growing up, uh, my dad was building uh, houses with his students and always took me onto the work sites. Um, it was it was there. I'm just gonna it, up. it was there that I became fascinated with the materials and processes dealing with construction, seeing the piles of lumber um, being brought onto the onto the work site, and then seeing the uh, the basement being dug into the ground, and then seeing the um, the foundation being um, um, being uh, poured with concrete. Those were all kind of very very fascinating to me as a young child. Um, I was born and raised in Kansas. There's not a whole lot out there in western Kansas. Um, you might look left and see a grain elevator. You might look right and see another grain elevator. 
look off in the distance and there's another grain elevator. And these giant um, concrete, large, cylindrical superstructures, for some reason, just kind of stuck within my mind. Um, I'm going to go through, I kind of floundered a little bit outside of high school my first one or two years. Um, didn't really have any uh, inspirations or any passions. Um, and then for some reason, I found a glass blown video online. And I just started YouTubing every glass blowing video I could find. And then I went and searched into a, uh, a database that had every school um, and every public access um, studio in the nation. And it showed that Emporia State University had a glass program. And um, I thought that this was, this was my path. This was really where I needed to go. So I really dove into it and um, started studying um, a bunch of glass blowers, and then I really um, found out that casting um, was kind of the work that was I was more drawn toward. But the hot shop was really where I wanted to be. So some of these are very very early into um, my art career. This is like the first sand casting in glass one, and then the the bust that we make in sculpture. Sculpture One. Um, I was really um, into making cups, kind of Venetian ware, and these are like glass um, two cups. Um, I thought I was was interested in this Ampelina spout, which is a this spout that you plunge your one rod into the glass and pull it nice and thin, and it creates a really cool little spout, but it's very, very challenging. I wasn't that great at it, but I tried and tried, and over time, you need to spend as much time in the studio as you can, and you get a little bit better. So this is about um, year two to year three. I'm blowing bottles, I love making bottles, love making really clean bowl shapes. Bowl shape is kind of one of the harder forms to make out of glass to keep that nice radius. Um, and then doing some cameo sandblasting through the outside surface to create like a Kansas landscape. And then we had a visiting artist come through by the name of Raven Sky River. And he's just such a great human being. And he just gave up all of his, gave us all of his knowledge that he had. And really it was him that showed me that you can make more than, nothing wrong with bottles and vases, but um, he showed me that you can make way cooler stuff out of glass. Um, and he was making this uh, Pacific Northwest aquatic life and so I really just, I went with his techniques and I was pretty much copying them. And for about a, a month or two, I made these octopuses. Here's me and Katie Hubbs making one of those. I believe it's the white one on the left. Um, I also used some of his techniques to make horse heads. So I gave this uh, black horse head to my dad and then I needed it for a show and it accidentally, not accidentally, but it sold. Um, sorry for taking your horse and selling it. <laughs> um, here's a warthog. Um, this was fun making, but I wasn't really into the heads. It's not really what um, was a part of me really. All these animal things I was making. Um, this is a casting with some model shark heads that are inclusions. Um, a bull nose with a, a copper bull nose ring. Um, this is like, this and another piece was one of the first pieces that made me attracted to like the mixed media aspects with glass. Glass looks really good with other materials as well. Um, during this time, I also had the opportunity to work with Patrick Martin to um, help install um, his hammock, his pill hammock. And almost as nervous as I am now, um, I was like, don't slip and fall into this hammock. It's not going to catch you. You're going to break every pill that's on there. Um, also, um, I was just spending so much time in the studio that they asked me to be the shop tech. And the shop tech position was almost as valuable as just learning how to blow glass and just knowing and understanding the equipment that 
the studio uses to make the material. Um, and then also TAing for Roberta and learning her um, approach to teaching was super valuable and beneficial. Um, but it comes time to your senior show that you need to start developing kind of a body of work that you're more interested in or comfortable talking about. And I would lean back on that, uh, those construction aspects as I um, learned as a kid. So I focused on making like um, these kind of iconic or um, how you say, it, just common materials in construction like nuts and bolts, bricks, a large screw. Um, that I made these threads that were able to um, thread onto each other and become a stacked object, an I-beam. And then here is my senior show. Pretty minimalistic, but I was just focused on having clean forms and making these um, forms nice and polished. Another form, after, um, my, uh, after my show, I had a little bit of time left over and I did some sand casting with the class one students while I was TAing. And um, I had made some threads with this material called Zircar and placed the Zircar into the sand and then gave the sand um, a coating of this just random color. And I really fell in love with how the clear glass looked with this more, um, it almost looked like a metallic, a metal patina almost. And I just really was interested in that contrast between the metal and the glass, even though this figure is all glass. And I also stumbled upon, whenever I was just researching on the internet, um, these monuments called Spomanix. And most of them were built in the 60s. Um, and they were about like the, uh, um, the resistance um, and the, the fortitude to get through um, the struggle with life. Um, but really what I found captivating about them was their scale, the repetition of form, the geometric shapes that they came, and then just how they kind of just um, came up from the natural um, surrounding environment. Also, just like the sheer scale and concrete that made that they were made from. This is the monument, monument to the revolution. Monument on Freedom Hill. And you don't want to be copying anybody, but in school, I think it's okay to do studies of master's works. So I pretty much completely copied this memorial complex and turned it into glass. Um, and then, so that's, this was about the time that I graduated um, and unsure of what to do after graduation. I got my portfolio together. I wrote, a le wrote this letter up um, expressing my interest and I sent it out to studios in Colorado and I sent it out to studios in Texas. And I got a couple callbacks, um, one from a glass studio in Essence Park and one from a glass studio in, um, kind of around Denton, Texas. Um, and I was most likely gonna go toward the Estes Park um, job. However, we had a visiting artist named Paul Nelson come through and I really was just um, helping Paul Nelson a lot. And Paul Nelson floated my number up to um, one of his good friends, John Miller. John Miller is a grad professor at Illinois State University. And he called me up just out of the blue and had asked me if I would like to be a grad student because Paul gave me a good reference. And um, so I got my portfolio together. They also want you to have um, a writing example. So whenever you're writing these papers in like art history, make a good paper because um, they're gonna ask for it in grad school. So I sent them this portfolio of my work, maybe about 10 more images. Um, and then I actually went to, um, made a trip up there to have a meeting with John and just having that lunch with him and uh, making that connection with him and also the reference from Paul. Um, I think that really established myself that I wanted to come to Illinois State and uh, he, they accepted me. 
Um, so that summer preparing for grad school, I wanted to have kind of a body of work to kind of already start making. Um, I'm not the greatest 2D artist. Um, sometimes I dabble with computer-aided drawings. So I had some of these drawings set up, um, and then I um, cut out these sh um, figure eight blocks of styrofoam to get ready to cast whenever I got there. Um, some of these works come up later. Um, the blue disc, um, I thought about a disc mostly because I was thinking about rondelles and glass, and a rondelle is a spun out platter. And a lot of times they hang these um, rondelles on the wall. And I was thinking of how can I make kind of a rondelle but cast it. So I was just thinking about a disc form. It'll come up later. So here's my tiny little space um, in the glass studio. They also gave us a huge space in the, in the, in the grab warehouse. And this is this will be kind of going through a little process shots. So I start off with like a styrofoam positive, make a, build a box around it and pour a uh, plaster silica mold, plaster silica mold from it. And then just using a flathead screwdriver, start popping out that styrofoam. And you get an empty void within your mold. You fill it up with some material you thought. I was making these forms in the hot shop that were kind of large and then thinking about like the spiral motion of the threaded bolts. Um, you're just doing these large wraps and some of them were cracking. Maybe it was a kneeling issue. And so I threw them all into the mold, uh, which came out with this beautiful blue disc. So as I'm cutting out some of these styrofoam shapes, um, I'm left with a uh, empty, I'm left with this negative space from the cutout. And I just thought these were great shapes themselves. They should not go to waste. And so um, in my tiny space, I was just making the biggest mess ever. Um, and <laughs> like bringing in a wheelbarrow full of concrete and then casting, um, casting these forms into concrete as well. And after I'd cast uh, these styrofoams with concrete, um, I'd have a little bit of concrete left over, and so I would always just empty it into a, a vessel, a glass vessel that I had. Um, and then after the concrete um, hardened, cured, I went with a hammer and broke the shell of glass off, and it was leaving this beautiful high polished surface on these concrete forms, which you really couldn't tell if they were glass or if they were concrete. The darker colored ones were glass, and then the gray ones are concrete. Um, I was also thinking about, um, I guess, more installation-based work. I really wanted to get rid of the pedestal um, within my show, within my installation. Um, and so a lot of these forms, I ended up started stacking on top of each other to really just make the pedestal. So that is the styrofoam positive, and then the casting of the concrete stacked on top of each other and here's the mold for that form um, then we have a biennial grad show at the university galleries there was these boy scouts um, like tiptoeing through this whole thing and i'm like there's these windows got to be about ten thousand dollar a piece and this twenty dollar concrete ball is going to go right through it um, and with this form, I thought it was going to be uh, the glass on the top side, uh, but I just wanted to see if how much uh, weight the glass could hold. I think it could hold way more weight, but also just kind of give a, a divide between the concrete floor and the concrete top. And then just playing a lot with balance and precari precarious installations. I took a trip to Corning for a glass conference and at the Corning Museum of Glass I noticed probably the most insane piece of cast glass I'd ever seen and it's the reflective lens um, for the Hale telescope which they made in Corning. Um, the first one they had a problem with and it had a crack in it and so they kept it at Corning and made another one. Um, so this one they don't actually use to refract light from deep space. But I was just so amazed by the scale of it and then this honeycomb pattern, I had to recreate it. 
Um, I was also looking at a lot of um, just columns and minarets and uh, obelisks and just thinking about how they like um, attract people. And so I made a set of three columns that kind of has a U-shaped um, U shaped form that really um, welcomes the viewer. And these almost became almost like spiritual or maybe ritualistic or um, some, some type of, I don't know, like a Stonehenge appeal or something. Um, just left myself and a lot of viewers um, with a lot of curious thoughts. And I really just enjoyed how the top um, glass capstones, whatever, really illuminated in contrast with uh, the, the concrete. Um, I'm not from Illinois, but they were asking um, some pretty big time artists from Illinois to have a show at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And John got me hooked up to be a part of that show, which was a cool experience. This was kind of my first big show. Here's a, here's a show to see how tall they are. Here's John's cool uh, french fries and chips. Um, and then I was making a lot of more or less three-dimensional work and then I thought, how can I make a painting out of my work? So I did this, two, this uh, perspective painting, painting, call it a painting, um, with uh, making these cutouts with a plasma cutter and then there's about an inch of space between um, the wall and the, these forms and so there's about an inch of space that you can cast glass into. Um, really only the far left one worked. Um, you can see the glass that, which I realized casting it colder, ladling it at a colder temperature, um, allowed it not to flow into the cavities as much because once the glass um, flew, once the glass went into these uh, windows, um, it kind of protruded a little bit and then that shrinkage as it shrinking caused it all to crack. But I, I really enjoyed how um, the cracks look. It looked kind of like a, um, a city that's kind of, uh, whatever, being in disarray. Um, then that Paul Nelson guy that came through um, Emporia State, he did this technique called uh, blow molding. And blow molding um, was pretty inspirational to me because I was kind of taking this uh, casting methods and working it into the hot shop and it was almost the best of both worlds and just thinking of the repetition of windows and those larger than life cylindrical forms i went to target and found these uh these um, silicone molds that i thought would be great texture so this is one side and then you invert it and it creates the more uh, pointy texture and process shots, you gotta make a chicken wire cage around these before you make your uh, plaster silica mold. The chicken wire helps hold all the tension from the bubble, you're, you're blowing into these so there's a lot of pressure being uh, built up within this. And so you use that chicken wire to, as a backing. So here's some of the forms after blown into and then looking into it. And then after I make forms, um, a lot of times I don't really have a completely end thought about where I want to go with my art. Um, I'm more or less all about process and then once I got all these components I start like building with them. And these were starting to look like a, like a cityscape of sorts so I started clustering them together like you'd see a bunch of sky risers together. Thinking of like overarching balconies. Um, and then just really playing with them. Um, I think I need to kind of still go further with this, um, but playing with light, light and glass is amazing together. Um, so for one grad critique, I set this up as like um, some lamps pretty much. Then in grad school at Illinois State, we had some pretty big pieces of equipment. So I, wasn't, I was gonna utilize that. I wanted to make some bigger work. And so I just decided to make some bigger blow molds. Um, I thought this looked so cool just uh, as a wax, but at some point that would melt. So you gotta turn it into glass. 
So this is um, what I, I titled the looking mask. And it kind of has an exponential growth of these bumps going from numb to a whole bunch on top. And then just really playing around with the texture and the grid pattern of, that I was able to capture from these molds that I had got. And so a different process. This one I created a styrofoam uh, circle, cylinders, and then pasted the wax on the outside of that styrofoam. And these are kind of um, inspired by the columns, um, those fallen columns where you'd see each segment of the column and how um, the bigger the buildings got, they started to stack the columns together instead of making it out of one whole chunk of stone. And thinking about those concrete structures and not wanting pedestals in my um, show, created um, a pedestal or table for this piece. And then this is my senior exhibition show. Or my grad exhibition show. Same thing with these chicken wire baskets. It was just the grid pattern um, that captured my um, attention first. And then um, I know people were blown into cage baskets. We did it in, uh, in undergrad. So go, let's just go big. Let's make some big old cage baskets. Um, I was really liking how they kind of changed this bubble form to more like a, some of these started to more, look more cubular or faceted, having like planes instead of like completely in the round. Then graduated. Um, I honestly, uh, grad, uh, grad school was so darn difficult. The amount of work that they want you to produce and the amount of writing they want you to have on top of all your work. Um, it was a little frustrated at times because I was like, I don't want to write, I just want to make. Um, but honestly, the writing really did help develop my work. Um, after grad school, um, John got, uh, he got asked to be a teacher at Pilchuck. Pilchuck's is an amazing glass school up in Pacific Northwest, just north of Seattle. And this is my first time, like you don't go out in the world and meet a lot of glass blowers. Um, but here being surrounded by like some of the top glass blowers in the world, you really just, it changes your focus up a little bit and you really have to, or want to step your, step your game up. Um, as a TA for John, they hooked me up and I got this sweet pad to stay in. John, um, instead of flying back home, he decided to buy a van. So we were just driving around the coastline in this van for a while, it's pretty cool. And this is Pilchuck, the inside of Pilchuck, they've got about four or five stations. And they also have a top chef who hooks you up with the best meals every day. And so they have a gaffer, gaffer is like the main glass blower throughout the campus. Um, the gaffer slot for this time was Dante Marioni. And then they hook up the, the instructors with a gaffer slot to make a piece with the gaffer. So John makes larger than life goblets. Um, so he was doing a collab with Dante to make a kind of a goblet inspired by Dante's work. And it was just so great to be surrounded by these top notch artists, uh, Ben Adels, Dante Marioni. This is Paul Nelson right here. And they were like, all right, we need some big guns to uh, carry this thing over to the new. Let's call Kale in. <laughs> um, also, I was able to watch the best sculptor in the world, Martin. Um, also, I was able to see probably the richest glass blower in the world, Dale. And then it, um, while I was there, um, I got a call from a guy named Robert de Grenier, and uh, he had been accepted into the Hall of Fame at Illinois State and was a visiting artist there for a sec. And same thing, just being there, surrounding myself 24-7 um, around Robert, um, he asked me to come to Vermont um, and work for him for about a year. It was kind of a crazy situation where I was living and on his farm with him and working with him at his glass gallery. And so I had kind of two jobs where I was taking care of animals. 
This is marmalade. Marmalade loved me because I gave her the best food ever. <laughs> um, marmalade was the uh, like the protector of the flock, but I don't think she did a very good job because there was always this bear that came around. Finally, we got it captured and taken care of. I had to crawl inside this tube with this bear to take a photo. But here's his studio set up. This isn't his house. This is just his gallery. Um, the white building is the gallery. The red building is kind of the barn, the workshop area. Then around back is the gallery. It was kind of a studio that I had not worked in before. It was kind of clustered, and the furnace was different. Um, but you know, after you build enough glass skills, you kind of will figure it out. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a kind of a top loader furnace where you had to push the top over then load from then gather from the top it took just a minute to get used to but no big deal um, we were doing a lot of walk-ins make your own kind of things where you'd assist um, the public in making forms and then i'd do a quick little pinch pony to blow their minds away we we're just making really dinky stuff like paperweights and hearts and stuff and then running the, the fair every Friday. And then he was kind of connected through a Brattleboro Museum. And Brattleboro Museum does a children's thing everywhere, every year where um, about 100 children uh, ride in to see if they can be a part of this kid's creation. And this, this is the write-up from the kid that I, uh, I was given to make their piece. Jose the Seventh. My picture is of a young water bottle and how his life went downhill. Jose is a taco business owner and his dad died making a taco for his friend. Jose started the taco business when he was only two. His mom is a rival business owner for Chipotle. <laughs> Kids have the craziest imagination. So this is his drawing. Pretty good drawing. I was amazed. Um, I don't know how old this one is right now. He's got a pretty, pretty slick mustache. Um, so I created a glass bottle. There's the glass bottle. <laughs> I, I needed a little bit more attention to detail. Uh, my eyes didn't cross quite as much. Other than that, I thought it turned out pretty good. I was also doing a little bit of cold working and gluing and polishing for Robert. More of his art is based off of a barn fire that he had where um, everything burned up in his barn, but all the metal pieces. And so he started making glass like handles for all the metal. And then just helping him do installations. Here's a hanging piece. Um, but Robert is more known for his um, award designs. He also makes the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards. So it's pretty cool to be um, part of this project. My job, these are kaleidoscopes. My job was to glue the three mirrors and the, the optical ball in the end. And then I was, I was thinking hard. I was like, I should slip in a note to LeBron and tell him to buy some glass from me. <laughs> I was also working for a guy named Nick Kekik. Um, Nick Kekik is like, one of the tightest glass blowers I met. His forms are just so clean, and I really, really loved working under him, just um, watching him create his work and um, learning under him was a pretty big deal. And then Robert had some type of a, a meeting with Tiffany, so I went with him to New York and checked out the MoMA, um, saw all these cool Brancusi pieces, but then I walked into this other gallery, and they had, um, an exhibition about the uh, all the Spomanex that I had witnessed or stumbled upon back in the undergrad. And I just thought that was so cool seeing some of these works I've studied. Not in real life, but just like an exhi exhibition of them. Um, at some point, I was just like, I needed to get back to family and hang around with my family more. And so I moved down to Texas and um, my brother, um, he had a little bit of time, um, so I got some free assistance from him, which was super beneficial um, in the glass world. If you making your own work is great um, by yourself, but working with a partner, you can kind of make bigger and better creations. And working with my brother, honestly, that was some of the best times ever. 
Um, so we were working and uh, renting time from Seneca Studios, making just pretty much vesselware again, so that we can have our own fairs. And we were just working there so much, they, uh, they noticed we were decent. And so they asked us to be a part of their first Friday art walk deal. Um, and I really wanted to make something, something I haven't made for a while or something different. Um, I wanted to create a blow mold. And so I went into Hobby Lobby with this idea of making a two part blow mold and just looking at all their forms that you can see in Hobby Lobby. And I found a, uh, a bust that I was like, this looks like a bubble. This looks like a form that I could blow a bubble into. So I made a two part blow mold. And here's kind of the process shots of this. You gather glass, gather some more glass, shape it up a bit. Then you do a final heat and uh, then you stuff it inside that mold. They close it down, blow hard. You come out with a finished product, not quite finished, but you come out with that shape. Um, pretty immediate, it's quick. Then we got to transfer it to work on the other side. And so using this technique called flopping it out, it um, created this like wave, wavy dress form, um, which is super elegant. And then I also did two of those uh, blow mold forms while I was there that kind of referenced the uh, more of the architectural stuff. So these are the forms I made that night. Um, and then looking inside of these, this blue and purple form, I think it was just as amazing. I kind of want to um, experiment more with looking on the inside of the bubble. And with this next slide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to need some assistance from Derek and Matt to touch this up. Um, COVID came around and I was just kind of stuck in Texas, not knowing what I wanted to do. And um, so with my, with my downtime, I became a painter. Uh, not the greatest. Um, I wanted it to be super textured, just throwing on oil paint, thick, getting it as thick as possible. I was like, that looks good. I think I'm almost done. And about a year later, I'm done touching it and it's still moving. I'm like, what the heck? Um, so I bought a kiln with my fat stimulus check. And then this is the first piece I made out of that kiln. Um, here's just showing the process job, I'm making the box. Then you gotta snake up the edges so the plaster doesn't run through the bottom. Stick it in the kiln, fill it up with glass, turn the kiln on, and it turns into this form right here that I've stuck up on my oval pedestal. And then this piece is in the faculty show. Um, I, I kind of want to get more back to um, like being a figural sculptor a little bit. So I started modeling some uh, plasticine clay and threw it on some styrofoam. Um, you can see this form um, at the faculty show it finished off. It's called Freckle Face. And then Molly, um, such an amazing person, asked me to be a part of her show at the EAC. And I think we were both a little bit like, what's it going to look like um, with our work kind of um, contrasting each other um, next to each other. And honestly, I think our work looks pretty great next to each other. Here's some cobalt blue bolts that I um, formed. So we have uh, like two tanks at our grad school and one tank at the end of the year, we like to turn into a color pot. And with this one, um, we got this really cool cobalt blue that I made um, really long, pretty much colored bar with, then stuck these colored bar into my, uh, my molds to make them solid colored blue. And here's these chicken wire baskets set up. I thought these looked great with the, the grid patterning of the cage um, in contrast with like the, the grid patterning cage with uh, Molly's print. Um, this is titled Piece of the Hail, of the Hail Telescope that I was inspired by. And thinking back, um, I swept up, well, we were doing like a lot of grinding of metal in the shop, and so I swept up all those, um, the metal from the ground, and I kept it, 
And I just started applying it to the surface of the glass. I'm thinking about just that, that high contrast with the, being able to see through the glass and then the, that cool patina of the metal. And these kind of became like asteroids a little bit, um, but I'm almost using them as like a guard so people don't walk into this main structure. Um, and then uh, people ask me a little bit if I get burnt in glass blowing. It happens once in a blue moon. I'll bleed that real fast. All right. That's it for this show. Thank you all for coming. Um, there's lots happening today. Um, we have a show at the EAC. We have a faculty show going on at the King Hall. Lots of other stuff happening within the department. And then the Glass Annex is having uh, Zach Royo do uh, some demonstrations. Y'all go down there and uh, support the Glass Guild and buy a pumpkin, please. Thank you all for coming. If you want to look more at those Spomanex, you go to the Spomanex database.org. To support the ESU Art Forum program, please visit emporia.edu slash art. Click on the events tab, scroll down to the art forum link and click, then scroll down to the support art forum button and click. Finally, choose your donation level and click on the continue button to complete the process. We appreciate your support.